Chapter 22 is over the drugs that we use for thyroid and adrenal gland problems. So the thyroid is one of the most important endocrine glands in the body. It's located at the base of the neck, just below the Adam's apple. It produces thyroxine, which is T4, and trio, um, triodothyronine, which is T3. So just remember the thyroid hormones are T3 and T4. Um, these are formed into the amino acid tyrosine and the mineral iodine. When they leave the thyroid gland and enter the body, they bind to receptors and activate the genes for metabolism. Important functions that these hormones control include assisting in brain development before birth and during early childhood, maintaining brain function throughout the lifespan, helping maintain the ability to think, remember, and learn, maintaining heart and skeletal muscle function, ensuring continued production of other hormones, and maintaining effective respiratory function and cell uptake of oxygen. Hypothyroidism is low thyroid function and low blood levels of T3 and T4. It slows the metabolism down. So you can see the signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism on page 408. Think low and slow, okay, like constipation, um, decreased hair, swelling of the face, especially around the eyes. Um, the person feels cold all the time. They're tired. They lack energy. Their body temperature is low. Um, they have a slow heart rate, a slow respiratory rate. Just think low and slow. Thyroid cells might fail to produce enough thyroid hormones because they've been damaged and no longer function or because the person's diet doesn't include enough iodine or tyrosine to make the thyroid hormones. So to increase the thyroid hormones, the gland cells can divide, making the thyroid gland larger, causing a goiter. You can see a picture of a goiter um, on page 407. It's that um, enlargement in the neck, swelling of the neck. This is a big indicator of a thyroid problem, either underproduction or overactive. If it's left untreated, hypothyroidism can slow metabolism to such a low level that the heart stops. When it's this severe, it's called myxedema and it requires immediate medical attention. Keeping thyroid function at the right level is essential for overall health. When a person has an underactive thyroid gland causing hypothyroidism, he or she generally has to take thyroid hormone replacement drugs for the rest of their life. Just like T3 and T4, these drugs increase the rate of metabolism in any cell that they enter, speeding up the energy use and work output of each cell. Um, there's a table on the bottom of page 408 that lists the um, different thyroid hormone agonists. Thyroid hormone agonists mimic the effects of the T3 and T4 regulating metabolism by binding to the receptors on DNA and activating genes for metabolism. The intended response of all of these is that the body temperature and level of activity remain normal, heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory rate remain normal, body weight is maintained, um, when the person eats appropriately, the patient is mentally alert, able to remember people, places, and events from the recent and distant past, and they have a normal bowel pattern. So basically, the uh, intended response for thyroid hormone replacement agonist drugs are just to every for everything to be normal. Side effects are overdoses. Um, if there's an overdose, they result in symptoms of hyperthyroidism, um, increased activity of cardiac and nervous system, enhanced action of drugs that reduce blood clotting. The increase in cardiac activity can overwork the heart and lead to chest pain, a heart attack, or heart failure. And in the nervous system, the increased activity can lead to seizures. This can, um, and then the enhanced clotting can lead to excessive bruising and bleeding. So before we give these meds, we want to monitor blood pressure, heart rate, and rhythm. Um, monitor that throughout treatment. I want to make sure that the dose and the drug are um, carefully compared. Um, thyroid hormone agonists are not interchangeable. The strength of each drug is going to vary, so they're not all the same. Um, and I want to make sure that I give the drug two hours before a meal because food and fiber actually impair the absorption of thyroid hormone agonists from the intestinal tract. Um, I want to ask the patient about any chest pain or discomfort while they're taking the med because this might be the first indication of some sort of adverse cardiac effect. And if they're taking warfarin, I want to assess for excessive bleeding because again, this can impair their clotting. 
teach the patient that the dose is going to start low and slowly increase until they have normal levels. I don't want them to increase the dosing on their own. I want them to follow the doctor's orders. Um, check the pulse every morning and every evening. Take the drug daily to maintain that normal function and take it before a meal or at least three hours after a meal. Usually we're going to um, take it or give it to our patients at like 5 a.m. because we want it to be well before their meal. Um, so because thyroid hormone replacement drugs can enter breast milk and increase the um, infant's metabolism, the mom that takes these drugs should not breastfeed. During infancy and early childhood, when the parent or patient is going through periods of rapid growth, he or she actually needs a higher drug amount per kilogram of body weight than an adult does. And if we have a child on these medications, they'll be on them for the rest of their lives. The metabolism in older adults is more sensitive to thyroid hormone replacement drugs, and they're more likely to have adverse cardiac and nervous system effects. If older adults have diabetes, then they're going to need to monitor their blood glucose levels more frequently. Then we have hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism is an increase in thyroid gland activity causing high blood levels of thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, um, and symptoms of increased metabolism. So when you're thinking of hyperthyroidism, think about someone that's hyper. Okay, You can see these signs and symptoms on uh, page 411 in that box. The person's going to have diarrhea. They're going to have trouble sleeping. They're going to be hot. They're going to be you know, shaky. They're going to have heartbeat irregularities, high blood pressure pressure, high body temperature, um, sweating, weight loss, even though they're, you know, they're hungry and eating all the time. Um, <clears throat> Another name for hyperthyroidism is thyrotoxicosis because the side effects of excessive thyroid hormones can cause toxic side effects to some of the organs. Um, the most common cause is brave, or, sorry, Graves' disease. The body produces excessive thyroid hormones and the body's metabolism is much faster than normal and the patient can develop that goiter that we talked about with hypothyroidism. So remember, a goiter is just a sign of a, hype, of a, sorry, a thyroid abnormality, whether it's hyper or hypo. They could both develop a goiter. These excess thyroid hormones increase the metabolism of all the cells above normal levels and make every organ work harder, especially the heart. When hyperthyroidism is severe, it's called a thyroid crisis or thyroid storm, and all symptoms are more severe and, and life-threatening. Most of the time, hyperthyroidism is a permanent health problem that's treated by destroying all or part of the thyroid gland by either surgically removing some or all of it, um, that's called a thyroidectomy, or by using radiation to destroy the thyroid cells. Drug therapy is used to reduce hormones before surgery, or if the patient is not a good candidate for surgery, like they can't have the surgery, then they may use these drugs long term. Thyroid suppressing drugs enter the thyroid gland and combine with the enzyme that's responsible for connecting iodine with tyrosine to make active T3 and T4. So this keeps the enzyme so busy working on the drug that it doesn't make active thyroid hormones. These drugs don't affect the hormones that are already formed and stored in the thyroid gland, so it can take as long as three or four weeks for a person to use all of that, those thyroid hormones that they made um, and have stored before the drug was started. There's a table on the bottom of page 411 for your anti-thyroid drugs or thyroid suppressing drugs. The response for these, again, is for everything to be normal. So with hypothyroidism, everything is already low and slow. I want to bring it up to normal. With hyperthyroidism, everything is hyper and too fast or too high, so I want to bring it down to normal. I want the body temperature and level of activity to become normal, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate to be normal, body weight maintained when they're eating the proper, the proper number of um, the proper number of calories, and I want their bowel movements to be normal. Most side effects of these are minor, like rash, loss of taste, headache, muscle and joint aches, itchiness, drowsiness, nausea, vomiting. Um, adverse effects are bone marrow suppression. Um, these drugs can be toxic to the liver. Um, they can also damage the kidneys, um, and they can enhance the action of drugs that reduce blood clotting. 
Before I give these, I want to monitor liver function test. If a patient has a liver problem already, the effects of the drug on the liver are worse and can happen at lower doses. Uh, again, I want to monitor the name of that drug um, and dose very carefully. Um, I want to, during treatment, I want to continuously monitor for any bleeding, um, like from the gums, unusual or excessive bruising anywhere on the skin, bleeding around IV site, um, the presence of blood in the urine, stool, or vomit. Um, and I want to monitor for yellowing of the skin and I want to monitor the white blood cell count because um, excuse me, one of the adverse effects of these drugs is bone marrow suppression, which reduces the white blood cell count and it increases the risk for infection. Teach your patients that are taking warfarin to keep all follow-up appointments. They need to monitor those levels closely, those, those labs closely. Um, instruct them to avoid crowds and people who are ill. Instruct them to avoid situations that can lead to bleeding and any other drugs that might make bleeding worse. Um, check the color of the roof of the mouth and the eyes daily for signs of jaundice. These drugs should not be given during pregnancy unless the benefits of treatment are thought to outweigh the risk in a life-threatening situation or when other treatments are not available. There's an increased chance of birth defects or fetal damage as well as miscarriages, so we don't give these to pregnant women unless they're going to die if they don't take them. When pregnant mom is in a life-threatening medical situation, the goal is to save her. And unfortunately, sometimes this is at risk of losing the baby. But if we don't save mom, we don't save baby either unless they're far enough along to deliver. And even that's extremely dangerous when mom is in a bad condition. Um, we also don't have mom take these while breastfeeding. If she needs them, we want her to not breastfeed. Um, and older patients, resistance to infection is already lower than that of younger adults because of age-related changes that happen in the immune system. So they're more likely to have um, in signs of infection as well as any other adverse effects. Then we have the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are small triangle-shaped endocrine glands that sit on top of the kidneys. They have two layers, the cortex and the medulla. The cortex secretes cortisol and aldosterone. Cortisol is a glucocorticoid and it's important for essential functions that regulate the body's response to stress, carbohydrate, protein, and fat metabolism, emotional stability, immune function, sodium and water balance, and the normal excitability of the heart muscle cells. Aldosterone is a mineral corticoid hormone that regulates sodium and water balance. Adrenal gland hypofunction results in greatly reduced secretion of cortisol and aldosterone. Um, common causes are autoimmune diseases that attack and destroy the adrenal glands, adrenalectomy, abdominal radiation therapy, and disorders of the anterior pituitary gland. Signs and symptoms of adrenal, hypo, adrenal gland hypofunction include hypoglycemia, salt cravings, muscle weakness, hypotension, fatigue, low sodium levels and high potassium levels. Without treatment, the person here would eventually die. Cortisol and aldosterone deficiencies are corrected by replacement therapy. We give corticosteroids to correct the cortisol deficiency. Um, they also somewhat help with that aldosterone deficiency. We might also give additional mineral corticoid hormone replacement, fludrocortisone, to help with the sodium and potassium balance. Side effects of fludrocortisone therapy are associated with the drug's action on fluid and electrolyte balance. Other side effects include hypertension, edema, hypernatremia, and hypokalemia. Remember, sodium and potassium don't like each other. The most common adverse effect is, is congestive heart failure. If CHF develops, the drug dose is either reduced or stopped. So I want to teach my patients to take it at the same time every day and take it with food. Patients should also weigh themselves daily and keep a record. They need to report a weight gain of two pounds in a day or three pounds in a week. They should also be assessing their pulse at least twice a day um, and use corticosteroid therapy with precautions. Um, you can look up those precautions when you go back to the corticosteroid chapter. Adrenal gland hyperfunction is when either cortisol is excessively secreted in Cushing's disease or aldosterone is excessively secreted in hyperaldosteronism. This can be the result of a problem with the adrenal gland, usually a tumor, or it can be from problems with the pituitary gland that overproduces hormones that stimulate the adrenal gland to produce more adrenal hormones. When adrenal gland hyperfunction is caused by a problem in the adrenal gland, surgery is the most common treatment. 
However, before surgery and for patients who are not able to have surgery, drug therapy can help manage the problems caused by adrenal gland hyperfunction. Some drugs suppress cortisol production directly or indirectly, and others control problems associated with hyperaldosteronism. Mifepristone blocks corticosteroid receptors. Um, metyrapone, uh, metodin, mit, mitonane, sorry, mitotane, um, and oscillogestat inhibit the adrenal gland production of cortisol, and spironolactone reduces the effects of aldosterone. The intended response is reduced blood levels of glucocorticoids and aldosterone, normal blood levels of sodium and potassium, and normal blood glucose and blood, um, blood pressure. Side effects and adverse effects. Um, side effects are headache, nausea, vomiting, skin rashes, dizziness, and hypertension. Um, it can lead to problems with adrenal insufficiency, and then a big adverse effect would be dysrhythmias. Teach your patients the signs of adrenal insufficiency. Keep all their appointments for blood work. Um, take the drugs with food. Assess pulse at least twice a day. Report jaundice, darkening of the urine, or lighter stools. And women should use two forms of birth control when taking mifepristone. Um, we do not use these in kids or women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. And that is all that I have for you on Chapter 22.